Hi, my name is Karen Marie. I'm an educational therapist and uh, a reading specialist. I have uh, my master's degree in education, which is part of the qualifications to be an educational therapist. Sorry. And um, my passion is uh, working with students. I have uh, three children, all processed completely differently. Um, and would have or could have been labeled, but instead the Lord took me down a different path and introduced me to a handful of doctors, and I was able to um, partner with the Holy Spirit and design curriculum that matches how a student processes new information, how their memory works, and where their academic skills are um, with the curriculum. So what you do is you basically take a kid that's been labeled as he's not being successful in school, he's perhaps he has a, a learning disability, and you look at that and you do testing and you figure out kind of the way his brain works, the way he processes, and perhaps those things are actually strengths, so you can take those things, strengthen his mind, his brain, so that he can learn better, and then you find that these actual disabilities are actually maybe divinely orchestrated strengths. And then you just kind of capitalize on that and get the guy super successful. Right. <laughs> that, that's exactly it. And, and one of the analogies that I use is uh, of a farmer. A farmer sitting in the classroom may look like a child that has attention deficit, that has a processing disorder, um, that um, is incapable of um, uh, sitting for a moment and um, getting any instruction in, but he's wired for um, his gifts and his calling. He's wild, wired to do what um, God created him to do and to be able to t pay attention to a lot of information simultaneously. Same with your CEOs of businesses, same with your inventors, same with um, your artists, your authors, your, um, and your governmental leaders. There, there's studies that have been done with um, the, the labels, with dyslexia, attention deficit, um, on, and you can Google it on uh, TED Talks, they're the top one to two percent of the population of the world, and they are the, the ones that, like literally neurologically, their neurons are farther spaced apart, they're able to see the whole picture, they're able to see the problem, and come up with a solution for the problem before the rest of the world even knew that there was a problem. So we're, we're talking about extremely gifted children, um, or we're talking about the kids that are, are low functioning. To me, the bell curve um, is, is I, I just don't like it. Um, everything that I do works on the lower end and works on the higher end because I'm dealing with people and we're all, we're all wired for our gifts and our callings. So it, it's, um, I feel like it's time. It's time for us to, um, to step into the place where we can help the kids discern what their gifts and calling are, what their strengths are, and, um, and if they need the curriculum tweaked, then we can tweak it. If, um, and what I do with my students is I train them. A teacher usually teaches what they, um, how they process. So I'll, I'll tell my students in an ideal world, um, they, should, they should probably figure out how you learn and, and, and tweak the curriculum to match how you learn. But this isn't the ideal world, and so what I would like for you to do is go in and see how that teacher thinks and how they process and switch up your style so that you can succeed in that class. So um, some of the things that I do um, informally, so um, in the next workshop we're gonna talk about um, very specific uh, neurological connections to be successful in the classroom. I want to concentrate today on uh, the levels that work with uh, their memory and uh, short-term memory and their long-term memory. So in, on your papers, uh, we're going to look at uh, skill level five. And one of the, the, I think one of the reasons why I um, am successful with students, one, and the number one reason is, is I partner with the Holy Spirit. There's lots of curriculums, there's lots of strategies out there, and the Holy Spirit knows exactly how that child is wired. And it doesn't matter whether you have your master's degree and multiple certificates, or, or you're a mom that hasn't had any sleep for t you know 10 years. 
when you partner with the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit will guide and direct you for what that child needs um, neurologically. And I always trust the parent's gut. They may not be able to put our educational jargon on it, but intuitively they love their child, they know what's best, and if we can partner with them and in partnering with the Holy Spirit, um, we're gonna get more done in less time. Uh, now, well, and the reason that I s said that is because I um, had difficulty in my memory, even though I got my master's degree, and so a lot of these, these um, strategies that I use um, have been helping me to be a, su a more successful person. Um, and because I have my master's degree, I can say, oh, well, I get to have a cheat sheet. Whereas someone else might be like, oh, you know, I'm not smart enough or whatever. No, no, we're all wired differently, and you do what you need to do, and you teach your students to do what they need to do to be successful. So all that to say, I have a cheat sheet for level five and for the hand movements. So the, um, on, not on your square paper, but on a regular piece of paper, write um, the, and there's, this is not in cement, you make up whatever you want, but I'm gonna share with you my tricks and then you can um, tweak it yourself. So um, for the hand movements, well, that's very nice. Okay, I have, there you go. <laughs> um, F for fist. And S for side. And D for down and U for up. Let's see if that is fist, side, fist, up, down, up, side. Yep, and then literally, it was too much work for me, so I had my students come up with all of the combinations of S, F, S, D, U, which is a mathematical <laughs> thing. So the um, average adult can remember sequences of seven. So um, the general rule of thumb is by upper elementary, they should um, memorize sequences of five. By upper elementary? Yep. Okay, so that's fourth grade, fifth grade? Yep. Okay. And, the, uh, and it doesn't matter where they start, and it doesn't matter how you get them there. So if I'm doing hand, hand movements, and they watch, and they, they aren't getting it, then I'll talk through it. I'll combine seeing and hearing and, and doing. Just whatever it, whatever it takes. Sometimes they need to, to say it. So on your paper, just write down some combinations. Um, I don't know, let's do four with each other so that, that we don't embarrass each other. <laughs> so come up with combinations of four. And then you can use this later on when you're teaching with your kids. You, no, double, double is good. And really, really interesting, the kids that see in 3D, um, a lot of those kids, when you do a pattern like this side, this side, will do side, this side, this. So it, it's just that Order and mirror. yeah, yeah, and that's when you see that you're not like oh no, it's like oh cool, I've got one of those kids, I've got a 3D thinker, and if, when we break through, he's gonna invent something, he's gonna write something, he's gonna do something because I've got one of those brilliant ones with me. What does that mean? Seeing in 3D, don't we all see in 3D? Um, so, in the in the the public school spectrum. Um, to qualify for a learning disability, if you're mixing up your letters, your B's and your D's and your P's and your Q's, it, it's not really a, a sign of dyslexia until third grade. But what happened is a bunch of teachers way back in the day were trained on, on the different characteristics of learning disabilities and the kindergartner teachers were like, oh, I have a child that has dyslexia. But developmentally, that's when they were, they're learning their left and their right and their top and their bottom and the directions of their, their letters. 
And um, so then we came, came through as a system and, and said, no, no, you can't label the kids, but they didn't train the teachers to actually work on those skills. So the, the retired teachers, the, the teachers that had been in the trenches for a long time, they just teach it. And then we have a generation of, of teachers that didn't teach the directions of the letters. Um, and so then we had a generation of kids that qualified by third grade as having a learning disability. And then I kind of came in with this whole system that I'm teaching you as the miracle worker. Um, and all I did was teach them eye-hand coordination and, and the developmental shapes. And their brain just needed one shot at it. I didn't even need to do a lot of maintenance with it. And their spelling scores and their reading scores jumped when I tested. I tested before camp and I tested after camp. And um, so in yeah. my mind, it's a little bit too intense to label a child right. that, that young. Um, what I found is you work on the direction of the letters. You work on your left and your right. You work on your B's and your D's and your P's and your Q's. Uh, and then Christmas, they take a break, and, and you feel like they've got it, and then Christmas comes, and, and then we're kind of back at the drawing board. That's okay, because we want that skill to transition, mm -hmm. and we want them to not be thinking about the direction of the letters when they're, they've learned to read, and they're now reading to learn. Okay. So um, those are the kids, you can catch that when you see on spelling tests and then they're writing, where they're putting a capital letter in the middle of the word. Mm -hmm. It's because they're, they're bright and they don't want to slow down to figure out what direction the letters because we went too fast during that stage. Okay. Literally everything that, that um, the, just that poem about everything we needed to learn, mm -hmm. we learned in kindergarten, literally that's true. So they're seeing it like as toddlers, we see shapes and they're, they haven't transitioned to seeing it as in actual different, like different letters. That's a beautiful segue. So. If you look at this, this is a pen. No matter how I turn it, it's a pen. That's object permanence. If I put it halfway behind the table, it's still a pen. So we do that, and the, they learn it's a pen. It's a ball. And, and they're, they're touching it. They're tasting it. They're using all five senses, and that's all getting organized in their brain and into their memory. If they have chronic ear infections, if they have um, vision that hasn't been corrected, if there's some kinds of sensory issues and they miss that, um, then it needs to be taught. And those are the kids that, so they're seeing in 3D, they have the object permanence, but then all of a sudden a stick and a ball could be a P, it could be a Q, and in their mind, no, it's just a stick and a ball until there's um, like meaning attached to it. So that's why peekaboo is super important when they're <laughs> babies and yeah. right. Them. Boy. Right, right. So that's object permanence. And then the, the next step then as they're getting into, into the writing is they do scribbling, they name their scribbles, and then they go into, which is another perfect segue, into the, the developmental shapes. Mm -hmm. um, I think my paper is on the ground. I want to get that. Thank you. So, um, on your paper, and I'll write one for the camera, the, after they come through that scribble stage, the first um, shape is a, um, let's see, just a, a, a vertical line. And then a horizontal line, and then being able to cross comes a little bit later, but I, I put those with because I'll take the kids, no matter what age they are, I'll take them all the way up through, mm -hmm. starting at the, uh, from the beginning. So you'll just ask them to draw a line, to copy, copy you? Yep, yep. Exactly like this in the paper like this. I'll draw one at the top, they won't draw one at the bottom. Uh, or like this. Yep. Okay. And then the next um, shape from there is a square. And uh, the circle. Now you can tell if they're, they're not developmentally 
uh, connected the four quadrants by their circles. So if there's jagged lines at the top, they're not crossing this midline or the bottom. So if they do something like that? Right, what you mean? right. Okay. Or um, a lot of times it'll be like an over, an over gap, like that. Oh, so that little cross thing. Right. We need to notice that. Yeah. Okay. So you're saying they're not doing what when they're not? So there's a, an imaginary <laughs> vertical line and a horizontal line oh. um, neurologically connecting the four quadrants of the brain. And so when they're not crossing those midlines, it'll show up in their writing. And what that is telling you is that you need to sit down and do chalkboard exercises, and they need to do giant circles so that they're crossing the midline and then reversing it. I had a little boy that had, oh my gosh, he had to have his hair perfect before he went out to ride his bike. His hands had to be clean. He just, everything had to be in order. And, um, and I'm... And he wasn't able, everything that I was doing to get him to see the B's and the D's wasn't working. And so I heard the whisper of the Holy Spirit, it's like, work on the midline. And so I did every medium possible, chalk, finger paint, like everything that was messy and gooey. And we just did giant circles on the garage wall, on the floor, uh, with the, you know, every single place. And I, I kind of felt like, a, you know, a, a, crazy woman, I was just like, draw a circle here, draw a circle here, draw a circle here. And then by the time, end of our, our session, he was able to draw a circle without any um, jagged lines at the, this side of the circle or this side of the circle. And, um, and then that was it. Mom was traveling 45 minutes. She was determined that she was gonna come up three times a, a week. And, um, and I ran to the car. In my heart, I knew, you know, she wasn't going to be, she's homeschooling all these kids, she's not going to be able to make that kind of commitment. And I, I'm like, oh, he crossed the midline, he crossed the midline, and she's like, okay, well, <laughs> thank you. And um, now, just to illustrate the gifted part, when I was in the home, mom said that, um, you know, he, he, kids, homeschool kids tend to be extremely helpful in their areas of weakness. And so when it's you know math time or writing time or whatever, it's like, mom, the trash man's here. We got to get the trash out. They're like, yes, go. And then you know, so it, they miss what they need the most. Well, she was doing dinner. He's supposed to be doing his work, and he asked to do something. And so she's like, here, draw this. And it was uh, his favorite um, car model. Well, he drew it from the aerial view. So I was like, oh. So he's, you know, I didn't have my terms of 3D, but it's like he's seeing things from a completely dis different perspective. Now, he can't, he can't um, spell, and he can't draw his letters, but he can draw an aerial view of detailed model car. That's a gift. Yeah. That's a gift. And I don't want to cap that gift. Yeah. I want to release him in that gift, yeah. but I also, he also needs to be able to read and write. And so, um, long story short, I never saw that family again. Five years later, I'm speaking at, at a huge conference. There's like 300 people, 400 people in the room, and they, I get introduced. She stands up in the crowd, and she's like, hey, everyone, <laughs> my son went to her, and, um, and whatever she says, do it. So that's, that's not me and my expertise. That's when you partner with the Holy Spirit, whatever the Holy Spirit says, you do. So, um, and then just continue on the shapes, then do um, the diagonal. Is that top left to bottom right? Um, whichever one, it's, there's no, doesn't yep, doesn't matter. And then the, Triangle. Does it matter how you draw the triangle? No. Okay. So for our handwriting, we do like, um, we broke down the letters into each of their component strokes and gave those strokes a name. Is that helpful? Or yeah, that yeah. No, so you're, you're taking, you're partnering with the Holy Spirit, you're going to the next <laughs> level. My goal at this age, you know, maybe four, a five-year-old, is, is to get it and for you to name it then and to take it to that next level is part of preventing the dyslexic piece. It's part of preventing um, the, the learning disability. Okay, and then the X and Asterix.
And then the diamond is about an eight-year-old shape. What is that shape? It is. I made that. Oh, that's a deer. <laughs> Yep. And then the interlocking circles is very interesting. Most kids don't have any difficulty with it at all. And then it's a huge clue when, when you see them just drawn completely apart and they can't interlock. So we've had some experience with students and their notes um, that to me seems pretty shocking. And so like, uh, for example, there'll be on the notebook paper, the red borderline, and almost the entire set of notes would have been put in just that border section. Because, right. you know, and so the student may have difficulty reading it and doesn't, you know, sense that anything was misplaced, but maybe something like this would be right, really right. helpful. Right, right. That's, this is, can they actually see, is that connection from their brain between seeing it and doing it, is that connected? Then an, another difficulty that you see is um, where the, the lines are on the page and they're not following any of the lines. So they're not anchored in, there's no spatial awareness. They don't know their top, their bottom, and their left and their right. Mm -hmm. To them, it's just, just anywhere on the page. And that's where you're naming things, that's where you're um, doing things as a school the same way. You know, I used to think, well, where's the creativity in that? But, you know, the sixth grade teacher that, you know, the, the, it has to be the paper and the page number and everything has to be labeled the same way, the same time, every time. But that's actually orienting the kids and, and taking a lesson that, that may feel chaotic if they're mixing up all of their noises and, and lining it up for them. Okay, so using language like, for kindergarten teachers, put this word under the next one on the line is super helpful because it's training them a certain way. Right, then that's, that's a, a really good segue because the prepositions are super, super important. And the directional words are, um, those directional words will spatially orient to them. So any lessons, you know, even, you know, where does the mouse go? On top of the table, under the table, any of those kinds of lessons for directionality, any of the stuff that you're doing like in your ninja camp mm -hmm. and, and that, that where you have left, right, top, bottom, north, south, east, west, um, and when you, and, and starting to play with that is super, super important. So if you have an older student and they have trouble with formatting, they just, like he's saying with the, they'll keep pushing everything or they start their notes all the way over. So you, that would be a clue to go, okay, we need to go back to something like this. Let's check out to see where it is that. Right, they... right. And so if they have the memory, if they have the visual memory to be able to copy, then you're looking at the orientation and then you're getting into the prepositions that, so it's in the language part of the brain. This is in the visual motor integration. If if that is fine when you look at it, then you're looking at language and the language portion of the brain, and now you need to orient them and, and kind of be like they're coming from another country mm -hmm. and, and having to give them those kinds of directional words okay. and follow those kinds of directional words. Now, from here to here, we're doing copy work. From here to here is a different yes. set of challenges. Right. So if a child can do from here to here, fine. Then do you go to the board activity that you were doing before? So I give you three words to write on the board, or I give, can I do this type of thing so on the, the board? Yeah, that's a really nice segue. So the, the first level is on top of. Okay. And then underneath or to the side. So they would trace what you have to start. Right. Can I call it tracing? Yes. Okay. So, so developmentally, it starts with the tracing. Okay. And, um, and so we're going to take a quick break and uh, we'll get back to that question in a moment. <laughs> I'm so glad that you asked about um, those papers that come, get returned to you that are a mess or you said that some kids do really well in diagramming and miss the notes or some kids do really well with the notes and miss the diagramming. So um, I would go back First, this is being able to, to visually see something 
and to write it down is, is called visual motor integration. And so I would start with visual motor in integration because it's the, the area that gets missed the most. Um, if we wanted to de-terminologize it, we could say copying. Right, right. So um, the first step would be tracing over the top, then it would be copying underneath, then copying to the side, then copying from um, here down to the, the table, and then the, the ultimate is from the chalkboard to the, so to the page. Further away. Right. And in the, in the, the, the school systems, they're, they're kind of missing this, this piece. And you have the, the honor and the, and the um, privilege to help orient kids and organize them so that they can better use the information that they have. But your papers are a clue to how they're processing information. So your, your kids that are, are doing the diagrams may, may be your kids that are, are the visual learners. And your kids that are, um, do well with the note taking may be your auditory um, and your visual motor. So anything that you do that is in the, their area of weakness, then you need to almost go back to this model of if they're having difficulty actually taking the notes, then providing the notes, taking the notes from the board down to the table. Mm -hmm. If they still have difficulty copying um, that, then having them um, almost the old, remember the old uh, learning stories where um, you would dictate and they would write underneath? you know, giving them space to write underneath. Um, but if, the, if it's that significant, then you really need to go back to drawing the shapes and seeing if they, they're able to maintain. Because it's a memory issue. If they, can't, if they can't draw from the notes to here, then you're looking at either it's a memory issue or you're looking at visual discrimination and they're not actually able to see the, the page. So at our school, we dedicate a significant portion of time to copying and to dictation. And so um, one of the ways we could space that out is to maybe have some of these as levels within that work. Is that right, right, right. And so in other classes like history or science, we can maybe, um, if we notice that the quality is not what we're looking for, we can keep this kind of as an outline in our head, how to teach someone to copy from the board. And if we're not hitting it, then we can start with not going slower from the board, Necessarily, but we can feed them handouts to say, "Hey, move! I want you to fill out the something like that." And then another layer would be, "I want you guys to copy from this paper to your paper," and then something like like that. Is that right, a good way right. to think of it? So that is concentrating on the visual motor integration mm -hmm. and the note taking. The end goal is the note taking. Now, if you have a child that's not processing what they're hearing. Then it would be, um, you know, the old exercises where you take a few words out, and so they're following along with your lecture, and then they have to fill in a word, so that you're you're keying them. So, so I'm switching from visual to auditory. Okay. So if a, a child is having auditory difficulty and they're not able to listen to a lecture and take notes, then you would do the same steps, except for with listening. So then you would give them their notes. Um, and you then you would take a, a, a word out, and so they would have to listen for that so word. A fill in the blank. A fill in the blank. Okay, so hold on, let me get this down. So this is so the first batch, the visual one. I'm going to call how to teach someone to copy from the board because that just helps me. And then this one, I'm going to say how to teach somebody to listen. Right. Okay. And so, is there a set of like five things like that? Um, or do you just kind of make it up? Based I just on, I just make it up based some on some of those tools. Then would be fill in the blank on a written notes. Yep. Another would be to have a word box because maybe in the language portion of their brain they're not understanding a word and so then they're not hearing the word. So a word box means vocabulary that we've gone over beforehand. Yes, and in on and visually on the page so they can pull a word that they need and write it in the blank. Okay, so if we're talking about photosynthesis. Right. Like, like, but if they can see it, and they're like, oh, okay, they've, they've right. got that visual connect to help them to hear it. Right, right. Okay, so vocab box, word box. 
Another thing that you guys do excellently here is being able to repeat back. So start with a short phrase and keep extending it. So memory work, we call that our memory work? Exactly, and that's therapeutic for a child that has auditory difficulty. Now, what, um, so when you have a child that's having difficulty either visually or auditorily, and you're teaching science, if you want to know what they know about science, you're going to need to ask or tweak the curriculum so that you're asking in their strength if that's what you want to know. So if you're, if you're testing them on note taking, then... So if we do a notebook check, Right. We are systematically excluding certain people. Right, right. Okay. But if we are checking notebooks, that's what we're checking is, were you able to do this? But, but that's not science knowledge. Right, right. But what you're doing is therapeutic. For the child, so for the child that's having visual difficulty, by doing a notebook check, you're... you're we're raising them up. Right. Okay. So right. we should do notebook checks. Right. Because they need us to. Right. Okay. But and then there's a different... So that's one set of skills. It, the knowledge base is a separate set of skills. Right. To gain, to understand that. Whether right. They, whether they know it. Right. Now, if they're, depending on what God's calling them to, if they're college bound or even vocation bound, they're going to need those skills. Yeah. So, but when you're grading them, mm -hmm. in the, the, I think there maybe needs, you just have to pray about what you want to do as a school. If you want yeah. to baby step them up to, um, so that they're working in their, their strengths and able to work into their weaknesses. So that would mean practically we would consider when we're trying to assess content knowledge multiple different ways of finding out. Right. Okay. So three tests instead of one test. And those are those are school. But that's the kind of thing you have to decide. So right. That's saying. what you have to. Yeah. And and I always partner with the parents because the parents have more of a, a, a even if they don't know for sure, but they have a gut level intuitive about the direction that God's calling their kids. Mm -hmm. And like I had a, a student that um, the parents, you know, she's a right brain thinker. She does well with manipulatives, and, um, and so why don't I teach her algebra right-brained? Mm -hmm. Because she failed in the linear left brain. And, um, and the parents were like, but we want her to learn left brain. We, you know, so for me to go in and say no, what happens if, if that's the direction that she's being called? Mm -hmm. And I, I gave the, the, um, the analogy of, you know, this, this girl, my, my uncle um, invented the soft serve ice cream machine. And uh, he patented that, um, started Dairy Queen, and then sold Dairy Queen, and kept, of course, his patent to soft serve. So every soft serve ice cream cone that you get, my uncle is getting royalties and, get, and making money on. Wow. He has his own island within an island of Balboa. And so I would, uh, so my student is wired, her, her hard drive is wired to make chocolate ice cream. And I'm asking her to make hot chocolate. She's not wired to make hot chocolate. If I take some time, I can rewire or I can add, make additional circuit for her to be wired to do both or to switch over to the other, but that's not how she's wired. So for me, and the, and the parents were like, no, we want her to do both because they have more of a discernment about her future and what she's being called to. Okay. So you really can rewire someone's brain to learn differently. Yes, yes, but my um, but why I partner with the Holy Spirit and with sure. the parents is because I I don't necessarily always want to. Oh yeah. You know, if it, um, I had a, a a child that was like a little butterfly, every time the Spirit moved, she was in motion, like she's just so in tune to the Lord. And as I'm trying to process how she's thinking and her test scores with her her family and with the teachers, um, I'm like, oh well, that's just like God. 
It's outside of time and space. Your child is outside of time and, and space. And um, the dad does one of these, and he's like, I don't want you to fix her. And the teacher, who's equally as prophetic, is like, but she needs to learn how to read. <laughs> <laughs> and so I came, uh, I, I wrote this book for her, um, in which I, it started my, all my theories on 3D thinking, is beautiful caterpillars in the, in the land of, of letters. And so just teaching them um, the direction of the letters and that you know in the land of letters a letter only goes one way there's always a top there's always a bottom there's always a left and there's always a right and w and there's only one way that's real so which one is the real one you know where's the truth and um, and because a lot of these kids that are 3d thinkers have extraordinary memory for stories sometimes it's a story that pulls them in and that's what happened with this little girl it's, and a lot of the kids is when I oriented them and I put it into a story then they, they fell in love with the letters and fell in love with the words. And then, because I've never met a child that doesn't want to learn. Every child wants to learn. And so finding and, and, and finding the key to open those doors is, is where we need to partner with the, the Holy Spirit. And you have so many things that, that you're doing here in this building that as an educational therapist are tools that I use to unlock doors. So let's just go to the next level. <laughs> um, so we've talked about that visual motor integration and the eye-hand coordination, which is um, skill level five. And then um, I think what I want us to do is just on your, a piece of paper. Oh, wait, wait. We started with our hands. So um, before we go to our, well, sorry. <laughs> I'm thinking my brain goes faster than my mouth, <laughs> or my mouth goes faster than my brain, or somewhere in there, the processing. So let's start with large motor and just brainstorm. Take a couple minutes to brainstorm of all of the different movements that you could have a student copy, from nodding their head, to turning around, to stomping a foot, to jumping, uh, doing a jumping jack, just different movements that you would have a child copy you doing. And I'll do it too, and then we'll share around the table, and then we'll have all have different ideas. It's like a sun in space, or right, right. Okay, so um, I did not come up with that many ideas. You, I'm thinking about being upstairs. So <laughs> let's um, share some of our ideas. I have down, spin in a circle, touch your nose, jump, stomp, leap, and making different noises. Nice. I have stomping, skipping, raising a hand, shaking your head, jumping up and down, hop on one foot, turn around. I love it. I put like exercises like jumping jacks, push-ups, or wall squats, or burpees, because there's several different mo movements in that. We kind of know where you're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> um, clapping, patting head, or touching toes, shoulders. Very good. Um, I also have a lot of the same things, but jump, stand on one foot, stick your tongue out, hold your right ear, hold your left ear, Okay, so I have touch your nose, wiggle your fingers, chicken arm, and flamingo <laughs> leg. I have stand up, sit down, arms up, arms down, touch toes, touch the top of your head, look left, look right, and jump. Very good. I think we'll do that every single workshop and just get more and more ideas. <laughs> Okay, so um, that is level five. Level six, we've actually already talked about, and just being able to copy. Um, and then all you're adding to the copy is you want to now build it, um, their visual, you've got their visual motor integration. 
They're able to see it and write it. Now you want to build their visual memory, and so then you cover it after five seconds, and they draw it. So cover it for five seconds. Yeah, and then they draw it. And I had a student invent just taking different shapes, and they trace over it. In fact, I'm going to... And then they put dots, which I'm going to do sloppily. So then they traced over it, and then they drew it with the dots. So it gives them a grid to work with. Yep. And then I put it on plastic. They erased it. Oh, sorry. They erased it and then had to draw it without looking at it. So with the image covered up. On the dots still or the dots were gone? On the dots. So then, I, yeah, that would be a good segue then to take the dots away and see if they can do it without the dots. Okay. That would be totally, and so that, when you, back to the papers that are all disorganized, you know, that's, that's what you're looking at is that spatial orientation. And if you train them, you know, to number their page, to stay on the left side, you know, that you're actually giving them orientation. Or another, I was, I was wondering sometimes, because um, I like to work with the kids on notebook paper a lot, but it takes a lot more work to be organized on a piece of notebook paper than a worksheet. So is it, is it kind of like having dots, giving them a worksheet for a few weeks? So that oh, yeah. get a sense like, okay, it's all down a column, it's all a line, and they say, guys, we're going to shift, and now you're going to be working in your composition book or a notebook, and so that, so that's kind of like dots. Right, okay. right. Very good. Um, then space on the, the back side of your worksheet, the space manipulation, then that would be to, to, to draw something the way that the teacher sees it or the, um, the mirror image. So um, any questions? Let us go on to memory. So we've, we're building up the visual motor memory. We've talked a little bit about the auditory memory, and you do it, And this school does an excellent job with repeating back scriptures, re, um, repeating back the catechism. That's all building that auditory memory. Um, the for kids that have difficulty with that, for kids that have difficulty integrating their vision and their hearing, one step I would add to that, and I call stepping it out. So for every word that they're memorizing, they take a step. Like a physical a step. A physical step. So they're walking around the table and they're saying... Um, the chief and the man. What yes. does that do? So that is integrating their vision, hearing, and their motor. And it's actually therapeutic. And uh, when the child cannot integrate what they see and hear, it's the biggest red flag for a learning disability, and you're actually breaking through and having them um, coordinate all four quad quadrants and all the visual motor, integrating it all, auditory motor, integrating it all, and, it, and then you're actually making neural pathways and eliminating a learning disability. Okay. So can I try to re yeah, say yeah. what you said in my own kind of jargon? Yes. Okay, so if we have a kid take a step for each word, that's causing them to connect um, of something that they're seeing because yeah. their they're seeing their body. Right. They're seeing the floor move. They're seeing the table move. Right. And it's happening in coordination with what they're saying. So that's why what they're hearing and what they're seeing link. Right. Okay, and then the fact that they're moving at the same time that they're saying coordinates their movement and what they're hearing. So it's tying together all three things at one shot if you just make them walk right. tied to each word that they say. Right. When they get it memorized. So I have kids in my learning center that um, will look at a spelling word and not be able to say it because it gets all twisted up. They'll be able to, I can get them so they can look at it and say it and see it and say it but then they, it gets mixed up when they write it. So I was having them um, say it forward, say it backwards, 
go to the balance board, hit a ball, come back until it was memorized. But when I started doing the stepping it out, mm -hmm. what I was actually doing was putting it into their brain using all of their senses. Mm -hmm. And then they were able to go, by the time they walked it out and had it memorized and went to a whiteboard, they were able to, to spell the words that were impossible for them to spell and they didn't get it mixed up in their mouth and they didn't get it mixed up in their hand. Even so, though you didn't train that directly. Right, it right. It was just with their feet. Right. So they're just like C A T. Exactly. And they, just they use letter names? Oh. Yep. Okay. Does that work with clapping too, or the stepping is actually the physical yeah. movement? More the physical movement. The more vigorous, probably, the better. Right. Because yeah. clapping is moving. Right. right. So now, now picture that with your kids that are in constant motion, that are having trouble with their eye hand coordination and with their spelling, that are having trouble being able to sit. Those are your those are your kids. Yeah. Um, kids that are a behavior problem, because literally, they're they have to think so hard to get the letters going the right direction, to get their mouth to say the right thing, to get the the letters on the page going the right direction, that their serotonin levels are completely dropped. Mm -hmm. Then you see the white face, you see the pale eyes. Um, the boys tend to act out and walk out and talk back. The girls tend to take it in and, um, and like my little student, overfocus, internalize, withdrawal, depression, her, um, she lost her vision, and, um, and just doesn't blink. You know, so your boys that are in constant motion, they're constantly building up their serotonin, good or bad. They just need serotonin. And, but the, the, um, my little girl was like not even blinking, just so focused, so wanting to please that she lost her vision and the next step, if I would have pushed her, would, would be for her to have a seizure. So we're talking about real neurological issues that when we walk through them developmentally, the Lord, re, it, it, we're actually part of the, the Holy Spirit's process of, of um, restoring, bringing restitution to what the enemy tried to kill, steal, and destroy. And then by doing that, releasing them into their, their gifts and their calling. So the stepping it out, sorry, the stepping it out is good for the wiggly kids and the overwhelmed kids, both? Well, and the kids that are, you're having trouble getting to memorize. Okay. You know, if they're with spelling, with, um, and what the, the good news is, the spelling is directly connected to the reading. I have some kids that'll step it out and write it out um, before they'll be able to read it because their visual system is not intact. So okay. then, so imagine in a, a room of 20 children. That, this is more of like a one-on-one -on -one situation, not having an entire class walking around spelling things. Yes? No? Yep. So um, I want to um, thank you all for being here. I'm going to answer your question after, well, or should I keep answering? Okay. So in a classroom, you're going to have, here's the only time that the bell curve works. You're going to have about 80% of your kids um, that are going to pick up your lesson. Yep. So then you have time where whatever your system is, you write your name on the, the board, you get a, a tag or whatever, then you can come up and be with the teacher. Okay. So it's, those are the, so you, you see it in the group mm -hmm. because they stand out. And then you work with them, them later. And you give them grace and mercy because that's your clue that they're not wired the way that everybody else is wired. What the enemy do, will do will come in and he'll, and he'll um, tell the lie to the kid that there's something wrong with them. And they'll label themselves because they're comparing themselves to everyone else. And they'll buy into that lie and all of a sudden it, become, it pr turns into a disability and it's a lie. It's not a disability. They're, they're processing in a way that's different, in a way that's more creative, and in a way that's probably going to invent something. I had a question about the stepping. So thank you so much, and um, I'll answer your questions afterwards. And I just pray that every child will see as God intends them to see, hear as God intends them to hear. They will process as God intended them to process, that everything within in their system, their five senses, will line up with the Word of God and be who they're created to be. In the name of Jesus, amen.